Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a new podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we will bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. Mosquito-borne diseases afflict a large portion of the world. In this month's episode, we consider genetic methods to eradicate diseases such as Zika fever, dengue fever, and malaria. Nikki Spahich from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Omar Akbari, Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology at the University of California, San Diego, to learn more. Many of you listening to this podcast probably consider mosquitoes a summertime nuisance, buzzing around during an afternoon hike or evening cookout. For many people on the planet, however, exposure to mosquitoes may be life or death. That's what motivates Omar Bari to develop new technologies for combating disease-transmitting mosquitoes. While the tiny bugs may not look like formidable opponents, there's more to mosquitoes than meets the eye. I started working with mosquitoes while I was in college. I had a summer job as a public service intern at the Washoe County Vector Control District. And it was there where we worked with mosquitoes in the field. I had my own sentinel chicken flocks, for example, where I would have to go out um, each week and extract blood and then test that blood for pathogens transmitted by mosquitoes. I had a mosquito fish colony where I would sort of raise the fish and upon requests from people, I would I would go to people's backyards and bring the fish and, and deposit them into their ponds to prevent the mosquito larvae from growing. I also did a lot of surveillance. So going out and trying to find locations where mosquitoes are breeding. And if I do find those locations, then we would treat with insecticides. Mosquitoes are vectors of disease, hosts and delivery vehicles for disease-causing microbes. One bite from an infected mosquito and the bacteria, viruses, or parasites causing diseases like Zika fever, yellow fever, dengue fever, and malaria could be coursing through your veins. These are some of the most deadly pathogens to humans. Um, It's estimated that with malaria, you have about 200 million infections per year with about 500,000 deaths. And unfortunately, those are mostly children under the age of five in in sub-Saharan Africa. Dengue infects about 100 million people a year. It's estimated that there's about 50,000 or so deaths worldwide. In general, for mosquito-borne pathogens, it's estimated that half of the world is at risk right now of being infected. That means that they live in areas where there's mosquitoes and those mosquitoes are transmitting. Because of this danger, humans have a long-standing battle with mosquitoes. Our weapons traditionally include using bed nets, removing water sources where mosquitoes breed, and applying insecticides, like Akbari did during his summer job. It was that job that actually got me really excited and interested in in studying mosquitoes. And I really learned how expensive and inefficient the current technologies are for managing mosquitoes and how much damage they do to to humankind. So I I wanted to to use my skills to try to come up with new ways to control them. The number one problem with insecticides is that they are kind of expensive and they need to be distributed to areas in which people need them. And they're short term. So you have to keep respraying. And then also, mosquitoes have been shown to develop resistance to insecticides. So that makes insecticides less effective. And so new insecticides have to be used or combinations of insecticides. And that just increased costs. Another con with insecticides is that they're not entirely species specific. So you see that they'll kill beneficial insects like honeybees. Since the 1950s, researchers have used genetic principles to eradicate insect pests in an effort to avoid insecticides. These control techniques are designed to be species-specific because their success depends on the mosquitoes mating. They also have a lesser impact on the environment than insecticides. The first success story was the sterile insect technique, or SIT, used to eliminate screwworm flies. Screwworm flies feed on warm-blooded animals, and the larvae can kill infected cattle by invading open wounds and eating the flesh. In the 1950s, Annual losses to American meat and dairy supplies were projected to be more than $200 million. Raymond Bushland and Edward Nippling from the U.S. Department of Agriculture developed the sterile insect technique in screwworm flies to tackle this problem. Bushland and Nippling introduced sterility by irradiating the flies' reproductive cells. Introducing irradiated males to wild populations broke the insect's reproductive cycle, 
as normal females mated with sterile males to no avail. As reproduction became increasingly limited, local fly populations crashed. This strategy first eradicated screwworms from the island of Curaçao, off the coast of Venezuela. Release programs throughout the 1990s eliminated the pests from the southern United States to Panama, and similar techniques have been used on a multitude of insects. As genetic technology has progressed, scientists have devised more sophisticated ways to create sterile male insects. Dr. Akbari's team used CRISPR to develop an updated version of this technology. The sterile insect technique is one of the most successful genetic techniques that have been used for, for insect control. One of the technologies that we came up with was this thing that we call precision guided SIT, um, PGSIT for short. And we tested this in flies and we're transitioning it to mosquitoes. Dr. Akbari's team engineered two Drosophila strains, one carrying the Cas9 endonuclease gene required for CRISPR mediated gene disruption, and another containing two guide RNAs for targeting Cas9 to genes required for fertility in males and viability in females. When these two strains cross, Cas9 joins the guide RNAs in the zygote, travels to the targeted genes, and cuts the DNA, destroying female embryos and eliminating fertility in male embryos. Only sterile male progeny survive. So you can essentially set this cross up, um, accumulate millions and billions of, of eggs, and just store them in the laboratory until you want to simply drop them in water in the field somewhere and out come your sterile males. And those sterile males will go find females, they'll mate with them, they won't produce viable progeny, and the population will suppress. Dr. Akbari's team is moving the system into mosquito species such as Aedes aegypti, the vector for dengue virus, Zika virus, and yellow fever virus. Because the genetically engineered mosquitoes die, leaving no fertile progeny, this technology is self-limiting or localized. The genetic effect does not persist in the population. However, repeated mosquito releases can lengthen the effect. Researchers are now designing sophisticated genetic systems, called gene drives, to reduce mosquito populations and limit disease. Gene drives skew Mendelian inheritance rules to increase the odds of offspring inheriting a desired DNA sequence. Scientists initially used natural gene drives, such as transposable elements, to insert DNA sequences, or genetic cargo, into a genome. These early techniques unfortunately did not give researchers control over where the sequences inserted into the genome. In the 90s, more precise editing enzymes improved sequence targeting. However, these systems rapidly accumulated mutations that could inactivate gene drives. Gene drives received a big boost, thanks to CRISPR-Cas gene editing technology. Genome editing that once took weeks or months can now be done precisely in a few easy steps. Once the CRISPR system and the sequence of interest inserts into a chromosome, the guide RNA targets the Cas enzyme to the homologous chromosome, where it makes a double-stranded DNA break. The break is repaired by homologous recombination using the entire gene drive as a template. With both chromosomes now containing the identical cargo sequence, 100% of offspring will inherit the gene drive and pass it down to future generations. Some gene drives insert fully functional genes into targeted genomes, while others use the cargo DNA to mutate desired gene sequences. Some gene drive insertions in insects cause female infertility or prevent females from being born by inactivating genes necessary for embryonic development. As the gene drive inserts itself into homologous chromosomes and inactivates crucial genes for reproduction, female mosquito populations dwindle, which is significant because only females bite and spread disease. So far, mosquito gene drives have only been built in the lab and spread in small caged mosquito populations. To appreciate the true impact of gene drives on a wild population, modified mosquitoes must be bred and released into the wild. When, after you do your release of your gene drive, it's going to spread and for a number of generations persist and then hit a point where all the mosquitoes in that area are going to die. Right, so you eliminate the you eliminate the population. So in some ways, that could be really beneficial, right? Because if the mosquitoes are transmitting the, the disease, and if you eliminate them, then you won't you will no longer have transmission. This process is known as suppression. Suppression gene drives are controversial because of the extreme outcomes, such as killing off members of a species, and the unknown consequences of releasing them into the wild. First of all, no one's ever tried this in, in the field. Um, there's been some laboratory experiments on this that seem successful, but of course, those are on small cages. So we need to test them on larger cages and potentially in the field. 
But one of the cons might be that once you eliminate a population from an area, then you may get reintroduction of mosquitoes from neighboring populations that then will just sort of reestablish the population. So that would require you to keep doing repeated releases of your suppression drive, and it may or may not be as effective as we want it to be. Another issue may be that if you're posing a very strong selective pressure on a population, in this case, a suppression gene drive that would go and spread and eliminate the population, then that strong selective pressure may force the evolution of resistance. And if you get resistance to your gene drive, then your gene drive no longer works. As an alternative, Dr. Akbari is working on something different, a replacement drive. In this case, the cargo sequence is a functional gene that doesn't kill mosquitoes, but instead gives them the ability to ward off the pathogen that they spread. The idea is that you use a gene drive as a shuttle to spread a desirable trait into a population. So perhaps you have a trait that can enable the mosquito from transmitting the malaria parasite. So if you put that trait into the mosquito and you link it to a gene drive, then the goal would be to release those gene drive containing mosquitoes into a population at a low frequency and then have them spread those desirable genes into the population. And then at some point in time, everybody in the population will have that gene and have the gene drive and in this case, be no longer able to transmit the malaria parasite. So if you get migration from neighboring populations coming in, then those are going to get converted over with the gene drive, and they're also going to be converted into being unable to transmit malaria. So it's a little more stable in that regard. The efficacy of suppression and replacement gene drives looks promising in the lab, but will this work in wild populations? Future work will need to test these genes in wild mosquitoes and against wild disease microbes. Researchers, ethicists, ecologists, and the general public are worried about gene drives spreading uncontrollably and having unknown consequences in the wild. Dr. Akbari's team is working on creating a gene drive that doesn't spread indefinitely, but keeps the cargo gene in a localized area. His approach is called a split gene drive, so named because the CRISPR-Cas9 endonuclease gene and the guide RNA sequence are located on non-homologous chromosomes and originate from different parent mosquitoes. The CRISPR-containing chromosomes may not always end up in the same gametes. So, as mosquitoes mate, they are not inherited together 100% of the time. Therefore, only a portion of the offspring will have the complete, functioning gene drive that can spread to future generations. It's a self-limiting type system where you have to kind of release both components into the population at a certain frequency. And the drive can stay stable in the population for up to four years if you do 10 releases. After those four years, it falls out of the population on its own. And that could be long enough to, to disrupt the disease transmission cycle. Currently, Dr. Akbari is working on building a replacement split gene drive in Aedes aegypti that hooks a dengue virus antibody to a split drive system. The gene drive will spread immunity to dengue virus in mosquitoes, leading to reduced virus transmission to humans. He thinks that the localized split drives are a safer option because they can be controlled during releases in the wild. If you notice any unintended consequences uh, during the trials, then one could go in and, and remove it simply by re-releasing wild type into that population. Whereas a non-localized drive is going to continue to spread and it's going to be very difficult to remove from the population once it's released. Non-localized gene drives may pose some challenges, but they can be beneficial in certain situations. If one wants to go into sub-Saharan Africa and spread an anti-malarial effector gene into populations, I mean, maybe, maybe releasing once would be ideal and have it spread to all those countries sort of autonomously, as opposed to having to go in and continually doing releases all over the place, which would be a huge effort, which may or may not be practical. So... I think there definitely is a trade-off between effort and safety, and I think it's going to be up to the people, the regulators, and the stakeholders to decide how they want to go forward. The communication has, has already begun, and it's well underway. I don't necessarily know how long it's going to be until a regulatory approval is granted for a sort of an open trial for a gene drive. But I imagine that maybe several years from now, we may be able to see those gene drives tested in the field somewhere. And perhaps maybe the first places these might get tried could be on very isolated areas where there's not much migration. The mosquitoes could be on an island, for example. So if something were to go wrong, then, then insecticides could be sprayed to remove the mosquitoes. 
While insecticides and irradiating sterile insect technique have been used to kill mosquitoes for decades, some members of the general public are wary of using the new genetic techniques to the same end. Recent public backlashes against Oxitec, a company responsible for releasing non-gene drive GM mosquitoes in Brazil, have made researchers particularly sensitive to the desires of local populations. Dr. Akbari carefully considers how to best engage with those living in areas affected by future mosquito releases. He collaborates with Simon Bloss, a professor of psychiatry from UCSD, about how to ethically introduce genetic technologies such as gene drives to lay audiences. Through their research, they found that concentrating on communicating the science in layman's terms and in native languages has the biggest impact. Additionally, the disease burden in an area also factors into people's willingness to accept new technologies. If you go into a place in Africa where everybody knows a person that's been affected by mosquitoes, either through malaria or dengue, and you ask that community, what do they think? I think that they would be a little more susceptible to trying something new because everything in the past has, has failed them. I think the take-home message is that you really have to know your audience and you really have to take the time to educate them and explain to them in a language that they can understand. Because genetic technology is a new concept for many people, Dr. Akbari thinks a stepwise approach may be best. Sterile male mosquitoes that result in temporary changes to the wild population may be released initially. Next, researchers could transition to a localized split gene drive using multiple releases and measure efficacy and look for unintended consequences. If the results look good, they could move on to a non-localized drive that spreads reliably with a single release. For this stepwise approach to work, mosquito researchers need multiple tools in the toolbox. Dr. Akbari strives to build a diverse set of genetic technologies, from precision-guided SIT to gene drives, to tackle these complex problems in the near future. The thing that excites me the most about it is that I believe it's a solvable problem. I think that some of the technologies that we are developing can be used to save lives and prevent suffering, and that's the driving force of a lot of our work. I really hope to make an impact. Listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Nikki Spahich. Please join us next month as we discuss how researchers use bacteriophages to battle antibiotic resistant bacteria. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.